Fit4 tries to wrap up all of the uh, questions that have been developed through the course of the poem, while at the same time, I would argue, leaving just as many, if not more, completely unresolved. It begins on the morning of the appointed battle. Gowan gets up and uh, he goes about dressing. So yeah, dressing. It's, again, a lot of little name checks for his intended audience of other knights, probably. Uh, the poet is tossing out little familiarities of, uh, of well, then he put on his chain mail, and there's a lot of this little tokenism that would be very familiar to a courtly audience. But also you have this concern throughout, as, uh, as it always is, with appearance, with the superficial appearance of, uh, uh, that he's going to make in, in this battle. And you, so he's putting on all this uh, clothing and the armor and all the uh, little appurtenances, uh, not, of course, leaving off the, uh, the green girdle. And he did not leave, leave off the lady's lace girdle for his own good. Gowan would not forget that gift. Then with his sword sheathed at his shapely hips, he bound himself twice around the waist, touching touchingly wrapped it around, his, uh, or with his belt, touchingly wrapping it around his waist. They mention that the, uh, the girdle is directly next to the sword. Oh, uh, hmm, well, symbolism there. Uh, and then he gets on Gringolet and he starts off. And <clears throat> um, with some directions from some locals, he wanders northward, uh, further, I believe it's northwards further, but he uh, he comes to what is uh, what is described as a wild place with no sign of settlement. So again, we're somewhere in the uh, the anti civilization, having begun at uh, uh, at Camelot, which is the apex of English civilization at the time. We are now in the wilds. This is a kind of Celtic primitivism. Um, he comes across a, uh, um, what looks like a large hole in the ground. It has all the appearances of a kind of, uh, burial mound, quite frankly. It's a cave with a hole, uh, with a hole on either end, apparently. But it just, it's a large, uh, like a burial mound, not unlike, uh, you'd see in, uh, Beowulf and um, the Sutton Hoo uh, uh, burial mound. But he's getting creepy and you can see the poet is drawing this out a little bit just trying to make the theatrics really well, uh, really strong. He's uh, uh, he's coming in says, you know, for certain this is a soulless spot, a ghostly cathedral overgrown with grass, a kind of Kirk church. Celtic word for church, um, where that camouflaged man might deal in devotions on the devil be on the devil's behalf. Actually, I think it's Anglo-Saxon. I don't know. Kirk. I don't care. Um, uh, my five senses, five again, pentangle, uh, inform me that the devil himself has tricked me in this tryst intended to destroy me. So he's stepping in. He's getting suspicious. He's wondering what's going on, and then he hears this sound, and it's this harsh, scraping sound uh, of metal on stone, and uh, it's this hellish screech, and he realizes, ah, I know that sound. That's the sound of an axe being honed, a little whetstone across the metal blade, and it's this hellish sound. And he's like, ah! So this tells him he's not alone. Great theatrics. This guy would do wonders in Hollywood. Um, and then, you know, he's sitting there, getting closer, listening to this, and then he hears the voice, you know, abide, came a voice from above the bank. You'll cop for what's coming to you quickly enough. <sighs> so now you've heard the sound of the, uh, the, the axe blade, now the sound of the voice, and then sight, the senses. 
Uh, then out of the crags he comes through the cave mouth, whirling into view with a wondrous weapon, a Danish-style axe for, cur for dealing the dent with a brute of a blade curving back to the half filed with on a stone, a four-footer at least. Um, so the first thing he really focuses on is not so much the man, but the axe. This massive blade axe that uh, that is going to use to cut off uh, Gowan's head. Um, so just notice how the it's introduced. He's not the poet doesn't just say you know and the Green Knight walked through the door and said hello. Uh, this was introduced very slowly by uh, uh, outside uh, senses, by the sound of the uh, the grinding, by the sound of the voice, by the appearance of the axe. This is all uh, external. Um, uh, external stimuli, external uh, senses that are signaling the approach of the man. It's not the man himself, it's all of this external stuff. Subtle point, but noticeable. Um, uh, then the uh, and also when he's a, when he does show up, then yeah. And again, he was green like a year ago, green flesh, pair of beard. So again, it's not so much the man he's noticing, but the color. It's all about the appearances, all about the uh, the superficial uh, sense of something rather than the uh, the actual thing. Uh, our brave knight bowed, his head hung low, but not too low. <laughs> You can tell, like, you know, the, the poet has his room sort of right there with him, has his reader right there with him, he's sort of drawing it up, but not too low. It's getting a little cheeky here. Uh, I like that. Sweet sir, the green man said, your visit keeps your vow. Gowan is honorable for having shown up. Uh, who among us would do the same? Uh, it's, it's, it's... This is essentially the test. Are you an honorable man? Do you stand up for, uh, you know, do you keep your word? Has the great valiant image and reputation of the round table would have it, Gowan kept his word. Um... Gowan goes. Uh, they uh, he goes and he uh, walks up to the man, the knight, the green knight, and uh, they say he feigned a fearless state, uh, bowing his neck. He's pretending uh, to be unafraid. Significant again, difference between appearances and reality, the interior and the exterior. Uh, and he lowers his head and he's just waiting for this shot. And the poet records the knight lifting the, uh, lifting the, uh, the blade. It's very dramatic and theatrical. And then all of a sudden, he's got the blade up there. Ah, <gasps> Gowan flinches. Gowan shrank at the shoulders. Then the swinging axeman swear from the stroke and reproach the young prince with some proud words. You are not Gowan. <laughs> he, uh, you know, he, he, it happens. Uh, and Gowan says, all right, you know, give me that one. Involuntary reaction. I flinched at first. But I will not fail, though my head's unhitched, it's off once and for all. You know, all right, fine, I'll do it. So he goes again, lays his head down, waiting for the blow. Um, this time, the Green Knight pulls back. Then he launches his swing, but leaves him unscathed, withhold his arm before any harm could be done. Uh, so, you know, he's just sort of like screwing with him a little bit at this point. 
Uh... <laughs> Gowan was motionless, never moving a muscle, but stood stone still, or as if they were as still as a tree stump anchored in the earth by a hundred roots. Interesting. Now he is a uh, natural image there. Uh, then the warrior in green mocked Gowan again. Now you've plucked up their courage, I'll dispatch you uh, properly. May the honorable knighthood heaped on you by Arthur, if it proves to be powerful, protect your neck. So the uh, the pulling back of the last one sort of makes up for the, uh, the previous where he flinched. So, okay. Tie score. We're going for best... Uh, uh, best two out of three here. And then, uh, number three. Um, <sighs> the ferocious blow, far from being fatal, is skewed to one side, just skimming the skin and finally snicking the fat of flesh that so so that bright red blood shot from body to earth just pulled just a little bit the green knights pulled back on the swing just a little bit so that the uh the blade just nicked him just <clears throat> gave him a little bit of a scar it looks like a little open gash on his uh on his neck that bleeds uh but his head is still on, and that that gash will probably heal. Uh, Gowan leapt forward at a spear's length, at least. So you know he's sort of like primed, and he just jumped out of the way. A spear is probably like six feet long, so you know he just wow, flew back. Uh, obviously, you know involuntary reaction recoil just sudden shock and stuff uh brought his shield to his side and with a shimmy at his shoulder then brandished his swords and blurted before blurting out brave words uh uh because never since birth at his uh, because never since birth at his mother's babe was he half as happy as here and now he loves life he didn't want to die he was going through with this because he felt he had to. Uh, he was sticking to the form of behavior uh, the, that he felt he needed to, but he wasn't. His heart was not in it. He wants to live. Um, enough swiping, sir. You've swung your swing. I've borne one blow without backing out. Go for me again, and you'll get some by return with interest. Hit out, or and be hit in an instant and hard. One axe attack, that's all. Now, keep the covenant agreed to in Arthur's hall, hall and hold the axe in hand. Keep the covenant. Sticking to uh, the form, sticking to the deal that they have. Um, and the Green Knight is oddly kind of okay with all this. Like, okay, okay, okay. He says, you know, uh, relax, relax. I love, I love the line, be a mite less feisty, fearless young fellow. <laughs> He's a little condescending, and but still, you know, like, hey, you know, take it easy. Take it down a notch, pal. Um, and he says, okay, yeah, this settles, uh, this settles the contract. And, you know, you, you lived up to your end of the bar bargain. You are hereby released. From uh, from the contract henceforth, having been satisfied, um, but then he goes, and he reveals a little bit more. One strike was promised. Consider yourself well paid. From any lingering loyalties, you are hereby released. Had I mustered all of my muscles into one mighty blow, I would have hit more harshly, and done you great harm. But my first strike fooled you, a faint no less, not fracturing your flesh, uh, which was only fair in keeping with the contract we declared that first night. For with truthful behavior, you honored my trust and gave up your gains as a good man should. 
So he's evaluating him on whether or not he is a good man. It's a test to see if he lives up to the reputation of the round table. Now remember, all of the other knights uh, were not so anxious to join in on this deal. They were all kind of cowering, I guess you could say, or at least standing back when uh, the Green Knight came into the hall that first, uh, that first evening in Fit 1. Uh, then I missed you once more, and this for the morning when you kissed my pretty wife, then kindly kissed me. <sighs> the Green Knight is the host. The Green Knight is the man who's been uh, he's been staying with in the castle for these last few nights. Um, so twice you were truthful, therefore twice I left no scar. So now remember, he took three shots with the axe. One, two, three. Uh, the first one, the guy flinched. The second one. Um, he, uh, the Green Knight pulled away, uh, and the third one, he, he left just a little wound. Three. Rule of threes. The, the stay at the castle involves three portentous nights, where you had three visits from the lady of the house. The first one, relatively harmless. Nothing much happened. Uh, a little harmless flirtation, an exchange of kisses, and at the end, uh, the next morning, a uh, an admission of a kiss, although never saying from whom. Uh, the second night was a little bit more heated, uh, a little bit more sexually charged, let's say, uh, a little bit more uh, significant. And then the third night, of course, was uh, with the exchange of the garter, where there there was a kind of um, a deception, where there was an injury done, because Gowan admitted to the kiss, but not to taking of the garter. Uh, threes. Because the belt you are bound with belongs to me. He knows all about it. Um, and, and in this, he, is, he feels he has caught Gowan in his lie. Uh, and this is then because he has dishonored himself in this. By clinging, by accepting the garter and by not admitting to taking the garter. He has shown that he is, uh, uh, he has betrayed the Arthurian ideal. He has uh, clung to this little magic garment that is supposed to keep him alive. Remember the spring at the, uh, uh, at the last strike? He wants to live. He loves life more than virtue. He loves himself more than the honor of being a member of the round table member of the round table should be willing to go and die for the reputation of the round table. He was doing that, but he had a little ace in the hole that he was trying to wiggle his way out of. He was trying to, you know, get a little cheat in there, which, you know, for modern ethicists, uh, we could probably generalize our way around. But here, in the context of this story, it is much more significant because it under, undercuts the entire chivalric code, which is based on this kind of honor of keeping to the form of an agreed behavior. Um, it is, uh, it's a brilliant little trap. Now, the, the knight doesn't seem to mind the whole kissing thing. Uh, the chivalric code, if you remember your, uh, your Andreas Capellanus, the chivalric code largely allows an awful lot of extra marital shenanigans. Uh, it kind of takes it for granted. Like, yeah, okay, yeah, it's not a big deal. 
uh, marriage should not be a impediment to love or something like that is the very first of the 31 rules that Capilanus lays out for how to be a uh, how to uh, uh, how to be a, a, a how to how to perform uh, romance or perform love the act of love in a courtly setting uh, marriage yeah you know everybody cheats it's not a big deal uh, marriage is for money don't worry uh, you do your loving on the side uh, but honor is something very different than marriage um, <clears throat> and so he takes Gowan to task for this Says, and I know of your courtesy, your conduct, and kisses, and the wooing of my wife. It was all, it was all my work. So he's saying that, you know, he kind of pimped his wife out here. Says, yeah, sure. I did all of it. He's admitting it at the end. Uh, I sent her to test you. And in truth, it turns out you're by far the most faultless fellow on earth. So he's got that. But there's always that one sticking point. As a pearl is more prized than a pea which is white in good faith, so is Gowan amongst the gallant slaves. But one thing more, it was loyalty you lacked. That's the flaw. Loyalty. Loyalty to the Lord, to what turns out to be the Green Knight, because he had promised that he would admit to everything that he won at the end. He didn't admit to the garden. Admitted to the kisses, the garden. He did not admit that he had it, and so that is a uh, a betrayal. He lacked loyalty. Fidelity is another term. Uh, I'm not sure about the original, but uh, fidelity, of course, is another word for faith. And so, in a test of faith where only he knew, supposedly, he failed. The test of Christian faith, you could take it as. Does he have true faith? Does he, uh, you know, does, does he lie in his heart and uh, while appearing to, uh, uh, by all appearances, is very truthful, but he is sinning in his heart? These are very significant Christian principles that are at stake here. Um, but think about loyalty in a social sense, that the idea of the round table is built largely on loyalty and faith, loyalty to not only Arthur as a political figure, but the ideal of Camelot. And so the reputation of the round table is built upon that idea that all of these people are living for something higher than themselves, that they are faithful to an ideal. How far does that faith go? Well, the Green Knight just tested it and realized Gowan, not quite the perfect ideal that the reputation would have you believe in. Gowan is the uh, the greatest exemplar of it of the Round Table. We've established that he is just, the Green Knight has just admitted that, largely because I think you know, all the other knights just sort of like you know when when the Green Knight showed up that one night at the party and every uh, everybody else uh, after the Green Knight threw down the uh, the challenge, everybody else was just sort of like you know uh, standing around you know checking their phone for. Uh, for a couple of minutes there. It's like, what? Oh, did somebody say something? Oh, I missed it. I guess I go. The perfection of the highly civilized Arthurian court has been exposed for being not so perfect, for being subject to the same human uh, instincts and uh, realities that everybody else has. They are not better than ordinary people, these knights. Um, 
the uh, Gowan knows he's been caught. He feels shame. The fire of his blood brought flames to his face. Uh, he, he knows he's been exposed as a kind of a fraud, but he's not willing to uh, go all the way just yet. Um, he says, my downfall and, undi uh, and undoing, let the devil take it. So now he's kind of bringing the devil in. He's blaming the devil. Uh, you could say that, well, maybe the because of this little game, the Green Knight is a devil figure. There was certainly some Stygian imagery on the the, the lead-in with the uh, with the barrow and the uh, and the axe grinding and all of that. Uh, but here, Gowan is not admitting that the sin was within himself. The fault was within himself. The lack of faith was any problem with what's going on in him. But he is saying, well, something external, the devil made him do it. Hmm. Such terrible mistakes, and I shall blame, shall bear the blame, but tell me what it takes to clear my clouded name. He's concerned about his name, an external, um, uh, a, a name is like a piece of clothing. It's something external to who you are. It's a label, uh, quite literally. And he, uh, he won't admit to it. But the nature of the sin uh, is <clears throat> not something that can be uh, shoved off like that. Not something that can be considered external. The nature of the sin is internal. It is original sin. The, uh, the selfishness that Adam and Eve showed in the Garden of Eden by uh, eating the, the forbidden fruit. Uh, you cannot escape original sin. It is born with you. It's within you. But he won't admit to that. He wants to cling to the idea that he is inherently perfect, but that something came and sort of like compromised him from the outside. The devil, perhaps. The Green Lord laughed and leniently replied, he's just having a good time at this. Like, you know, he's much more human. He's much more recognizable. Uh, in this scene, he's much easier to identify with. All right, I mean, he's, he's, he's a big green guy, but, you know, he's, he's, he's sort of funny. You know, at the beginning, he's like, you know, hold your horses, calm down, let's take it down a notch. Now he's saying, you know, hey, he's just sort of laughing and saying, you know, the harm which you caused me is wholly healed. By confessing your failings, you were only free from fault and have openly paid the penance at the point of an axe. But kind of under compulsion. He paid the penance. He, confession and penance are two very loaded terms in, in this because, he, in a sense, he has gone to confession and uh, he has paid a kind of con uh, penance for it. Uh, but, uh, but it is all under a kind of compulsion, I guess you could say. Uh, and so how sincere is it? Uh, and this green, and this gold hem girdle I present as a gift, which is green like my gown. It's yours, Sir Gowan, a reminder of our meanings when you mix and mingle with princes and kings. So he wants Gowan to take the girdle. He's like, you know, yeah, you, you hold on to it. You have your... But specifically, you know, it's a reminder of our meeting when you mix and mingle with princes and kings. Well, when you are mixing and mingling with princes and kings, you feel pretty good about yourself. You tend to uh, think, yeah, all right, I am, I am really great, which is kind of what the mood was in the party in, the, in Fit One. But the girdle is supposed to remind you of your sin your failing, your original sin, your pride. So here he's saying, you know, use this as a, a reminder, uh, uh, this little token that will recall to you that when uh, push came to shove, you didn't always act so honorably, that 
you are human. You are flawed. As a member of the round table, you might believe your own press clippings, but you are flawed. Humility. Christian virtue. Uh, it's one of the things I, you could say that one of the primary themes of Christ's teaching, teaching is humility before other men, before God, certainly, but before other men, always putting somebody else before yourself, which is a kind of, which is kind of baked into the chivalric code, uh, which is all about uh, serving people, uh, um, service to your Lord, service to one another, putting someone else's needs before your own, uh, but is in performing that kind of servitude, in performing that kind of uh, role, external form of behavior, is that also a kind of egotism? Is that also a kind of pride? Are you too elaborately enacting this service, which seems humble, but is really just a way of calling attention to yourself of aggrandizing yourself, of claiming a virtue that perhaps you do not feel in your heart. <laughs> this is touching a little close to home for, uh, for Gowan, and he then goes on to uh, an old standby when you're in a corner, um, well, you kick women. And critics have noted that uh, uh, his speech that follows has certain familiar uh, tropes to it. And they have called it a tirade, they have called it a screed, they have called it a rant, um, but it is all uh, this, this hellish uh, 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 condemnation of uh, women. After having blamed the devil outside, devil is a tempter, right? Uh, now he's gone and he is going to blame women. Not just any women, but specifically temptresses, women who tempt. And so he reaches into uh, his knowledge of uh, biblical history, because we are in a very uh, biblical frame here with the idea of confession and sin and all that stuff. Uh, and, and he blames Eve, whom he doesn't even name by name, you know, Adam fell because of a woman, Eve, uh, and Solomon because of several. Solomon had how many wives? Um, and as for Samson, Delilah was his downfall. And, you know, and David and Beth, Bathsheba. So he's blaming all of these women who are known to tempt men, to draw men away from the virtuous path. Uh, He's projecting again. He is denying responsibility. If only we could love our ladies without believing their lies. Oh, we would be perfect if it weren't for them. They infect us. We're perfect first, but they infect us. Uh, again, this denies original sin. Original sin, uh, the belief, the Christian belief in original sin is that when you are born, you have original sin. It's baked in. The minute you become a human being, you are a sinner. It's not something that comes from outside. It's not something that, you know, you pick up along the way. You are not perfect at any stage. But he's clinging to them because he wants to believe it. Um, yet all were charmed and changed by wily womankind. Wily, you know. Uh, wily. Uh, it's the same word that they use to describe Odysseus all the time. People who are cunning, people who are sneaky, uh, people who have no virtue. Oh. Uh, it's 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 straight up misogyny. Um, I I don't know that you know you can necessarily say that. Well, this means Gowan's a misogynist. 
first of all, the standards are going to be way different in uh, in you know the medieval era to uh, to the modern era. So that's kind of ridiculous to apply. Second, obviously. It is misogynist because they're taking part of some of the same tropes that we have seen throughout in terms of, you know, Eve is a, an easy fall, gar fall girl in, in that story. She will take the blame, whereas Adam sort of gets left and sort of he's just going along for the ride. He's not given a whole lot of agency in that story. Fine. That is a given. But he's lashing out because it has to be outside of him. The problem has to be outside of him. But he accepts to some degree, you know, but the girdle he went on, God bless you for this gift. God bless you. He's a little bit of a bite to that, you know, God bless you. Because now he's feeling a little bit of pressure, feeling a little bit of shame, perhaps. He's saying, you know, I'll take it. Thank you so very much. Again, appearance and reality. But he is invoking uh, not just morality, but specifically religion here. Uh, so it is more about the form, the external practice, than the, the internal beliefs. You know, God bless you for this gift. Um, that's not the honor of dealing man to man as the Green Knight has been pushing throughout, but that is invoking the outward form of civilization and society in the form of religion. Um, but I'll take it as a sign of my sin, the girdle. Uh, I'll see it as such when I swagger in the saddle. You know, when I am feeling good about myself, yes, I will remember my sin because I will be wearing this uh, girdle, which is, you know, it's, it's a sash more than anything. It's like a little ribbon that gets wrapped around. Just remember that. Um, uh, a sad reminder that the frailty of his flesh is man's biggest fault and how the touch of filth taints his tender frame, clinging to that innocence. Uh, innocence. His tender frame is perfect, but sin comes from outside. So when praise for my prowess in arms swells my pride, one look at this love lace will lessen my ardor. So again, it is supposed to protect him from something that is coming from outside. This, the pride, the infection of pride will come from outside, but he will cling to his, uh, his garter, his sash, as a way of protecting against it. Um... <laughs> but he says, you know, uh, but one thing I want to know, it, just tell me your name. Okay, Green Knight tells him his name, Bertilac de Haudesert. Um, uh, Gowan is concerned with the name. We've seen already that names have a certain ring of labels. They are external uh, to who the person is on the inside, uh, and it's a, uh, it, but it's his curiosity to know that. You can say that, well, it seems only normal that, you know, it's a little frustrating that we don't know any names at this point. Uh, Bertilac de Hauptbesert. Uh, Bertilac, uh, I believe, means green, uh, uh, green lake. Bertilac, lac is lake, and Bert is an uh, inversion over the over years of, uh, of green. That er sound is in the middle, uh, and then Haup Desert is the high, uh, the high desert or the high wasteland. High, uh, you know, it, it, most scholars believe it means like the moors of Western England, uh, like uh, like Wuthering Heights land. Um, and in my manor lives the mighty Morgan Le Fay. Morgan Le Fay. Okay, now that's another name. That's a name that's going to set off a lot of uh, ding-dings for people who are read in on the Arthurian literature because Morgan Le Fay is a witch. Morgan Le Fay is the half-sister of Arthur. Uh, Morgan Le Fay learned from Merlin lots of, uh, uh, lots of tricks to be a witch, 
and she is kind of behind this whole thing. It was she who cast a spell on uh, on on the Lord Bertilac. So uh, at his request, they came up with this plan. It seems uh, to go and test deliberately to test uh, Arthur's round table and the glory of Camelot. As you can see, like Morgan Le Fay sort of the outsider feeling a little bit you know perhaps jealous of uh of her brother and you know oh he's so pristine let's let's expose him for what a fraud this really is uh so they cast a spell on uh on Bertilac and he turns green and gets big and he can obviously lose his head and just get along fine without it um but it's 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 all hurt significantly of course she is a woman so we're back in that well it's all the woman did it uh, you know Bertilac himself he's, he's performed like he said he's probably the most charming character in this whole uh in this whole thing he just you know he, he's got a real sense of humor but he uh but it is the the the, the plan uh, is really the product of Morgan Le Fay, and that gives it a certain, uh, certain yeah, misogynist cast to it because the woman has to come up with the the bad, uh, with the evil. Um, she guided me with this guys to your great hall. So here he's kind of throwing her under the bus too, uh, uh, to put pride on trial and test with this trick what distinction and trust the round table deserves. So he's laying it all out right there, saying, okay, uh, you know, we did this all, it's kind of a game, but uh, it's, all a, it's all a game for a purpose. It's not just to entertain us on a cold winter night, but to get at the truth, to expose uh, the fraud that is the chivalric ideal in Camelot um, and he says you know hey you want to go meet her because remember uh, Gowan is Arthur's nephew so Morgan Le Fay is in this his aunt he says, come on come you want to come say hi to your aunt she'd love to see you catch up you know show some pictures swap some stories uh, and you know he's kind of begging off like, no nah, that's all right I, I really don't want to uh, you know family um, but he uh, he makes an exit. Then he he leaves. He uh, he goes and he winds through the wilds of the world once more. He's coming back out of this uh, this uncivilized, natural, wild place, uh, which is really uh, linked in a lot of ways to a kind of Celtic tradition of like an other world which is not really a place you can find on a map, but is a very mystical and mysterious place. Um, and, you know, but now he is returning to the world proper, meaning Camelot, civilization. And he's coming back and he's got this garter around him. And uh, he goes in and, hey guys, I'm back. And they're all, they're all there. They come around, they crowd around him. He's in braced by his band of brothers, quoting Shakespeare from a couple of hundred years later. Um, but the, uh, he tells them the story. He shows them the scar to give proof, visible external proof of what he is saying, because maybe they are not going to take his word for it. Uh, so he has to provide some external proof. Um, and uh, they are all quite taken with the uh, uh, with the garter itself, which he is now officially wearing. It says as a sash, slantwise from shoulder to side. Um, uh, and when he. Uh, as he's telling this story, he grimaced with disgrace. He writhed in rage and pain. Blood flowed toward his face and showed his smarting shame. Again, the external, the appearance, the visible, uh, is having now some, you know, it, it, it's, it's about the connection between what is, uh, what is out 
exterior, what is visible, and what is interior, what is just intangible. Uh, regard, said Gowan, as he held up the girdle, the symbol of my sin for which my neck bears the scar, a sign of my fault and offense and failure of the, of the cowardice and covetousness I came to commit. I was tainted by untruth, was tainted, passive mood there. Um, not something he did, it's something that was done to him. This, its token, I will drape across my chest until the day I die. For a man's crimes can be covered, but can never be, uh, can never be made clean. So it seems to have sunk into him what this means. But curiously, uh, you can't really say the same about the round table here. The other knights, they see it, they say, wow, that looks really cool. And yeah, all right, you got this nice little story about how it proves your honor. Doesn't really prove that. Um, but they all take to wearing one as well. A sash from shoulder to waist, uh, green. And what this is, is the, uh, uh, the, uh, it, it is essentially a costume that is adopted by the, uh, the so-called Order of the Garter, which still exists in England today. Um, uh, in Britain, and it gives a uh, it shows a distinction. It's like uh, it's 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 like a knighthood itself. If you were inducted into the Order of the Garter, it means you were a you know a, a champion of British values or something like that. And it's meant to be a great honor, and they'll wear this. But it's an honor that, in its origin, is really a mark of shame. But they, they look at it and say, hey, that looks really cool. Um, and hey, it proves you're honorable. So we're going to adopt that. And then over time, supposedly, it becomes adopted for, the, uh, for this more general uh, order of the garter, not just the round table. So you have a kind of reverse, or you have a kind of ideology here, where it's laying out you know, how something came to be. Uh, where, okay, in Britain at the time, supposedly, uh, there was the Order of the Garter, and they wore a sash this way, and now the poem is just explaining, well, this is how the sash got to be that way, which is a cute little uh, spin on the story at the end, and you could take it as that if you ignore all of the moral questions about it. You can just take that and say, oh, this is about why those guys wear the green thing across their chest. I get it now, this makes sense. Uh, but that's leaving aside all of the questions about original sin, about moral, uh, about moral righteousness in the, uh, on a human level, as opposed to just sheltering inside these outward forms of society and civilization that the, lo that the loyal order of the garter uh, actually profess to, uh, to, to herald. How do you deal with that? Do you just take it as the uh, the uh, as the story of how the order of the garter came to be, and ignore all the other questions? You can retreat into an appreciation and pride in uh, uh, in this outward form of great civilization, great refinement, great honor, or you can attend to. Well, no, the, the troubling aspects of it, the, the questions of individual faith to the creed, individual uh, loyalty to the ideas you, uh, you claim to support. Are you, are you wearing that sash as protection against an outside sin or as a reminder that the sin is within you? It's... It's very uncertain. And the civilization aspect of it is, uh, is obvious because the green garter, the green uh, obviously uh, associated with the, the green knight and all that and nature is very clearly a sign of the, uh, the wildness of uh, the, wild, the wild associations. 
of the uncivilized, of the Celtic tradition uh, that rejects or at this point was really kind of at war with in the west of England, at war with the encroachments of English civilization over Celtic tradition. And here you have then the, uh, the English civilization simply appropriating uh, colonizing the uh, the symbol of wildness, the symbol of primitivism, if you will, and it's very troubling that way. It doesn't really resolve that question, and in fact, it really um, it, it it sits there as a burr in the saddle as you're trying to come to a comfortable conclusion with this story because so much of it is left uncertain. So much of it is left just hanging there. But the question always comes back to who is honorable? What does it mean to be honorable? Can you be honorable inside no matter how it looks on the outside.